Welcome to the On-Premise IT Roundtable Podcast, the only show that dares to be both on topic and on location. Each time we meet, we bring together IT luminaries to discuss a single concept. In this discussion, we're addressing the question of whether you should put secondary and primary storage on the same storage system. Before we begin, let's quickly meet who's on the panel today. Hi, hi my name is Chin Fan from Malaysia. Uh, I tweet at uh, storagegaga.com and my, my blog at storagegaga.com. I'm Chris Evans. I can be found at Chris M. Evans Online, and you can find me at www.architectingit, where I'm an analyst and blogger. And I'm Ray Lucchese. I blog at uh, rayonstorage.com. I'm a Greybeard on storage.com podcaster, and uh, you can find me on Twitter at Ray Lucchese. Excellent. So this can sound kind of like a fine point maybe to people who aren't familiar with storage, but it's actually an important one. And uh, it's one of those things I think that a lot of us in the storage industry have been kind of hammering on for years. And that's the question of whether it's a re rational, reasonable, useful, best practice to uh, separate data, you know, backup data, secondary data from primary data. Basically, should you have it on the same machine? Should you have it on the same code base? All that kind of stuff. Um, who wants to start out? Maybe the grayest gray beard wants to start out by giving us the... Uh, the you know, the biggest challenge with having primary storage and, and secondary or your backup storage on the same storage device using the same storage code and everything is if there's a software failure that occurs that happens to wipe out all your data. Not only does it wipe out all your primary data, but at the same exact instant in time, it wipes out all your backup data this could be a challenge for most organizations. Yeah, I mean, most organizations don't want to lose all their data. You would think. Yeah, it seems important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you, know, you could look at the opposite argument and say that actually in certain circumstances it might make sense to share the same platform. So for instance, if you're using snapshots and you've got a second platform you're moving the snapshots to, it's all same, part of the same infrastructure, so that it could be the same technical platform and still work. I mean, the NetApp has done this for quite a while with their Snap Mirror solution. They have both, you know, a, a primary NetApp storage device and a secondary NetApp storage device, and they provide some sort of, you know, backup secondary storage with that sort of solution. I can see there's some advantages. Mm -hmm. And I, I kind of agree to that, but basically what Chris said was uh, actually quite, quite true because you got to look at, um, you know, where your data is and what your priorities are and so on and so forth. And obviously there's a lot of benefit, you know, having snapshots online on the primary storage. You can, there are ways to access snapshots uh, with APIs or other solutions that can give you access to those snapshots and provide a capability of extracting that information. Change block tracking solutions that provide information about you know, what incrementally has changed and all that stuff so that your storage system can be different from your secondary, you know, primary storage can be different from your secondary storage and still provide some sort of, I'll call it an air gap for less of, you know, for a decent word to use. Air gap is a good word. I, I guess the, uh, the way we're headed here is we're trying to separate the difference between physical separation and platform separation. So, and the two might be, might be different areas to address, as in, for sake of argument, the NetApp consistency of the same platform, the same technology, but you might actually air gap it by having two boxes. That might not be the same as having two totally different vendors providing two totally different solutions. And, and that's really, to me, where the question comes in. I mean, basically, if it's the same code base, there are risks. There are definitely risks that come from that, right? You know, I mean, you can have bugs, you can have all sorts of things. If, it's, if, you, if you're using native primary storage capabilities to back up data, then you have other risks. You know, there, there can be cascading failures and there can be, uh, you know, I mean, obviously bugs, but there can also be uh, security risks in terms of people getting at the primary system and then getting at the backups that way. Um, if, if they're connected, there can be risks. There are all sorts of risks, and don't you want to minimize the risks? It's hard to say, but it actually depends on circumstances. You know, there are a lot of times where you have actually you know, the same code base, you can actually have the operational efficiencies, you can actually, you know, move things like uh, the DDU blocks uh, quite easily and so on and so forth, right? So those are the things that I think, uh, you know, we should actually encourage the uh, use of online primary storage as backup, right? How do, how do you understand what all the risks are? I mean, you said a lot of different things there, Stephen. There's a lot of different risks. I would say that those risks get mitigated to a certain degree by good process. So for instance, you're not going to go and upgrade every single box in your infrastructure on the same day. 
that would be slightly foolhardy if you introduce a, a bug across all of that technology. So there may be ro rolling techniques to allow you to do something. So you know, there's, there's ways and means to mitigate it, mitigate it. I'm not necessarily advocating that I would have everything on a single, unified, interconnected platform. Now that, you'd have to be a bit of an idiot to do that, surely. I agree, I agree completely. I mean, I, the, the challenge with some of this is that uh, automatic updates happen nowadays. You don't even have control over when things get updated, especially, you know, SaaS solutions and that sort of stuff. Once they start updating, it, it gets updated and rolls throughout the world. And uh, yes, you can control some of it, but no, you can't. Um, you know, the perception is that, you know, I worked for a company for a long time. I won't name the company because they no longer exist, thank God. But we had, we had calculation that said the likelihood of losing data was one in five million years. And the first time we had a software bug and lost data, that sort of stuff goes out the window. It's not just hardware, it's not just software, it's the system. You have to concern yourself with all the system and all the risks combining those together. Now, when you put primary and secondary storage on the same system, you have a challenge. What risks are you trying to eliminate? What risks are you, are, are you <laughs> adopting when you do that? And I think that those risks are inherent to the decision to put it all in one basket. Yes, 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 even though you might have an air gap. I mean, even though you might be able to control the update and the rolling updates and that sort of stuff, those are good, yeah. but not sufficient. I just want to touch back on the, um, the point you made there, Ray, about calculation of percentage of risk. The trouble with things like that is they're always skewed by other figures that you don't really take into consideration. So, for instance, you could have um, a mechanical flaw in hard drives that causes them all to fall, fail at a similar time, which if you're working on an assumption that the, the statistical risk of it failing is consistent, not biased in some factor, then you will misunderstand the statistics and you'll, and you'll calculate your risk incorrectly. So that can be a big problem. And, and sometimes maybe you just have to have an extra belt and braces process. Belt and braces as in, as in, as in. That's right. Well, I mean, you take your belt off and your trousers are going to fall down. You put, a, you put your braces, you put your braces on just in case your belt breaks. I want to mention the fact. Technical note, by the way, for our audience, braces is English for suspenders. Okay. <laughs> oh, no, no, that's not, that's not, okay, yeah. Fair right, enough, understood. All right, all right. I just want to say that the shuttle, right, the shuttle went, when they launched the shuttle, would typically launch, I think, with five or six systems, four of which were designed and implemented by IBM, and the last one was designed and implemented by somebody else. I'm not sure the name, Robert, you know, whatever it was. But they actually had different code, different hardware, different system, different people working on them all together. This was something that was, you know, obviously the shuttle is man-rated and all that. It's trying to make it sure that it doesn't, doesn't have failures. But the same concept applies today. How can you beat that shuttle and all that stuff? I agree. You, you were entirely correct. And I have seen environments where um, people have decided not to put the same vendor at either end of a replication pair and they've used a, they've used a different technology because what they didn't want to do was have exactly what you said that, that consistent like a bug be, be occur on one side that um, gets replicated to the other um, the trouble I think with all of that is that there's only so far you can go and there's only so much money people have so people always make compromises and they try and avoid as much risk as possible, but they don't have infinite money. And in the space shuttle argument, I would suggest that they probably had a pretty much infinite money. But nowadays, you can also see a lot of vendors actually pushing a no-tier kind of uh, solution, right? No-tier, basically, you can just put your data anywhere, but it's more of uh, location, the premises, the geography, and so on, right? So basically, they're just going to use the same kind of uh, backup regime across the entire fabric. So I remember when this, this idea of having a single tier first moved, mooted by Hitachi mm -hmm. as part of HCP, what, 10, 15, whatever, how many years ago it was, I remember sitting in a presentation saying, you may need to back this stuff up because they were saying, you never need to back it up, it's fine. It all goes into this one tier, and I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, the great beards are like, I got to be kidding me. Said to me, you never need to back it up. I won't name names, but I'll tell you afterwards yeah, when we're not recording. Yeah, and I, I remember. Like the end of desk, right, is here and all that stuff. I remember thinking, no, no, I'd rather have at least another copy somewhere, even if it's a dead, cold, cold copy, shall we say, that we I don't touch. For, I worked for a company one time. We installed a system in, uh, in a very volcanic region. In Europe won't won't be named, and uh, 
Every once in a while, the operators would go out for a smoke and they open the door and these little sulfuric fumes would go <laughs> dissipate throughout the IT uh, data center. And we had a particular system that had an optical connection that was sensitive to these optical, these sulfuric fumes. We'd lose dozen discs a day in this system. They'd be replacing discs as fast as they can. Luckily, the system survived, but you just can't tell what's going to happen here. That's, that's exactly it. You can't. And I, I feel like, um, how about this? Can we all agree that there is a risk or some risks inherent on having one system for primary and backup? So let's actually flip that around then and say, what about the benefits of some of these systems and do they outweigh those risks? Because that's really what the vendors are saying. Now, only a fool would say it's the end of backup. Only a fool would say that. But um, how about thinking about, okay, if, if, if so many backups fail and if they're misconfigured and the systems don't work and all these other problems, if you can mitigate some of those risks and take on some different risks that are maybe less risky, um, does that make it worthwhile having primary and backup on the same system? I think Chris articulated the, the discussion, and I think Chimpha too, which was that you have certain automation capabilities or, or better integration between those systems that you can have if they're all the same system. I mean, SnapMirror is an example of that. I mean, it's all kind of integrated within the NetApp Net uh, on-command services solution and stuff like that, and you don't have to do anything to back stuff up. You just, you just fire up a SnapMirror. I think there are advantages to ease of use, operations, uh, there's probably economic advantages, having two of the same thing rather than having two different things and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm an advocate for that, you know, basically having the same code base and having the same efficiency and basically, you know, what I think NetApp has been trying to do is actually trying to actually uh, virtualize the entire uh, process, right? I think that's uh, is a good thing. I would um, add one little piece to this and that's um, as we go further and further into um, cloud, we're seeing less and less visibility of what the platform might look like. So people might get quite comfortable with the idea of thinking a single vendor or a single environment is looking after all my data wherever it happens to be. And we don't necessarily know what's behind that. So there might be a feeling that people could look at it and say, oh, well, it's okay. I, I, when I do it in the cloud, it's all on the same platform. So I can just take one platform from one vendor and that'll be fine. So we might find that actually causes us issues because people misunderstand things. Yeah, I think the cloud, to some extent, is a good example of all this because you're right. I mean, you don't see what's going on in the infrastructure. You're backing up to cloud st cloud storage. Uh, you're using cloud storage for your primary applications and that sort of thing. I think the advantage of some of the clouds is that they do have a segregation between, let's call it primary storage and archive or backup storage. And, and in that environment, the perception is, whether it's real or not, I have no idea, is that you're actually doing you know, separation. You have an air gap. There's, there's different styles of storage that's behind those things. Uh, yeah, you're storing your temporary data on you know, uh, block storage and you're you know, putting your uh, permanent location as an S3 object storage or something. That would be the, that would be the prime example. Yeah. As an, just, let me just finish that one off. But if you look at that on, say, Azure, it looks like they have a sing single unified it, um, platform for actually provisioning storage. And then it looks like then they provision up blob storage or block storage from that storage layer. I'm not saying they def definitely do that, but I don't know when I look at that how distinct those two are. So if I was building something where I wanted to protect my application in that cloud, I wouldn't know whether blob storage was safe enough or compared to block storage. Um, because I haven't got any visibility of what that situation is. So that actually just makes it really confusing for me to know what to do in that situation. Yeah, I don't know about Google Cloud would be a similar type of a situation there. You, you don't have the visibility of what the physical storage looks like in that case. In fact, it could very well be the same. And I think that this leads to, uh, I'm not sure if that's the point you were making, but one of the things you said a few minutes ago actually was um, that as we move further and further toward the cloud, we'll have less and less visibility and understanding of what we're actually using. And that means that ultimately we could come to a point where uh, we think we're being redundant, but we're not, you know, and, and that basically we, it's not a, it's not a issue anymore. It's not a thing that people think about anymore. Uh, you know, it reminds me a lot of uh, the sort of gray beard argument over, you know, oh, well, you know, we can't use RAID 5 for databases because RAID 5 is slow, or I need to make sure that my indexes and my tables are on different RAID sets. Uh, we don't generally talk about that anymore. Yeah. And we've moved away from that, even though the, 
those were ironclad rules, and yet now they basically don't matter because times have changed. Is, it, is that what's happening here? It looks like it. It does <laughs> look like it. I think that there's a performance aspect that, that made those parent needs before, but no longer are present in today's technology. So yes and no, I would say. There's, there's, there's parts of that that said, you know, performance has moved beyond just spare disks and stuff like that, where you would need to have separation. So could we imagine a scenario where a vendor provides a single platform that goes across multiple physical instances, physical servers, physical locations, but they segregate different types of data across that to make it redundant in the, to protect against loss of either a rack, a server, a site, and so on. Isn't that S3? And uh, To a certain degree, yeah. And then, then you're putting yourself only at the risk of bugs in their software. But then that's still, I mean, it's still a big risk. But, it, but it's get, we're getting closer and closer to not having that risk at that point. Absolutely. And, and also there's a question, you know, to, to, to again further the S3 analogy, there's a question of how much do we really need to know? Um, you know, who knows how many copies of your data Amazon is storing? Nobody. They won't tell us. We're trusting their SLAs. They, they will tell you that they'll store a minimum, a yeah. number, right? They won't tell you what the maximum number is. So, um, but I mean, and you pay for that to some extent. My, my other thought on that, just to finish that little segment off really, is as a ex and recovering storage administrator, um, I was always paranoid about having any sort of loss. So I would always over provision uh, systems so that we always had spare capacity, we'd always have extra backups, we'd always do just a little bit more than we really needed to simply because stuff happened. So I think despite the fact that we might not need to do it, people do it anyway simply because that's the way that people inherently work. The question is whether current people who are not storage administ administrators that have 20 or 30 years of experience will feel the same way because equipment today is so much more reliable than it used to be. In, ra in raised day, compar comparing it to your, uh, your description earlier. Yeah, and a lot of organizations right now, you know, are questioning the old processes, you know, and so on. They say, why are we still doing this, right? right? Because it has become so, uh, you know, with the integration of the cloud becomes so seamless. And then we kind of forget that some of these discipline really has to be applied. And some of the things that we always did are because of technical limitations, like, you know, like the backup schedules, for example, uh, were because of more technical uh, reasons than, than practical or uh, objectives, you know, actual business objectives. Yeah. So uh, I, I, we have to wrap it up. I'm going to ask each of you to basically sum up with the answer. The, an you know, the question being, um, are you ready to mix primary and backup data on the same device, the same system? And um, you know, given this discussion, given what you've been thinking about, uh, Shinfa? I think given the circumstances, I think yes, you know, it's, it's okay to actually put it within the you know, primary system and use it as a backup as well. I'm going to go right down the middle because on one hand I can see scenarios where it would be practical and there are other scenarios where in larger environments I think I'd, if I had the cash I'd be separating things. No way. No way in hell. I mean, I, I am a single endpoint user. I've got a Mac and a laptop, and that's it. I've got backups on Dropbox. I got backups on disk. I got backups on a safety deposit box. I got. I carry a backup on my iPad. I don't have a gray beard, but I am with Ray on this one. I literally have backups on air-gapped, powered-down disks in a in a fireproof box. Uh, that's how I am. Um, and I am not ready to advise a company or a client or anybody that they should uh, have uh, backup uh, and primary data on the same device. Um, maybe I'll come around to it, uh, but I haven't yet. So uh, I guess that's, uh, that's, that's where we stand. Um, so uh, thank you very much, everyone, for listening. Uh, this has been a great discussion. Uh, in fact, this is one of the rare on-premise IT roundtable podcasts where we have not reached consensus. Um, most of our podcasts, in fact, we have, uh, we have reached an answer, and this one we didn't. I love that. Um, listeners may not love that. Well, thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this discussion, remember to subscribe, rate, and review the show on iTunes, since that really helps our visibility. And also share the, this episode with your friends. This podcast was brought to you by GestaltIT.com, your home for IT coverage from across the enterprise. For show notes and more episodes, go to GestaltIT.com slash podcast. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.